all the thoughts begin to slow down as you let go of the day behind you. If you like, you can do some gentle head rolls just to release any tension in the neck. And as you breathe in, feel the heart opening to receive. Nice soft belly. Relaxing the buttocks as you sink down into the chair. The arms and legs grow loose and limp. And any stress or tension just drains out your fingertips. Drains out the soles of your feet like sand through an hourglass. It's as if you were falling back onto a stream of golden light. Not swimming against the current. No resistance. Just letting the stream carry you as you open to receive. As together now, we take that journey from the outer to the inner, as always led by our friend, Bethany. John, you can hit track 10.
And again, a nice deep breath. <sighs> Relaxing even more. Floating on that stream as you breathe in the peace of God. Breathing in energy and life, prana, chi. Breathing in the divine intelligence of the universe. Knowing that every breath, every bit of oxygen is awakening the wisdom in the cells. It's feeding the blood, the bones, the tissues, the organs. It's harmonizing and balancing the metabolism, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the chemical factory of the brain. And every exhale is a letting go and releasing releasing old emotions and energy, toxins, waste, dis-ease. And it all happens without effort. In and out, in and out. As you begin now, Breathe it all out. Releasing it all back to the nothingness. Letting it dissolve in that stream of golden light as it dissipates and you feel your spirit rise freer, unencumbered now. Consciousness, the Buddha heart, the possibility matrix. Enter the natural spaciousness of the mind as all words and thoughts slow down. simply rest at one with the presence of God, listening.
this divine oneness. Begin now to feel gratitude, appreciation. What are the blessings in your life today? What is there to be thankful for or about? Be sure to call to mind at least three things that you can be grateful to yourself for. Three things that you can honor about you. stretch your consciousness to be grateful for future blessings, that which is still in the invisible, but even now moving towards manifestation. As we give thanks for our collective good, vision, the staff, the volunteers, chair that we sit in, the beings around us, the time and space to gather like this, the freedom that we have in this country to gather like this and believe or not believe, whatever we choose, the paved roads that got us here, plentiful water to bathe in and drink abundant food, so much good we stop to appreciate tonight, and in this state of appreciation, we now begin to make decisions, so decide, how do you want to feel tonight? when you leave here. Imagine yourself at the end, getting up and walking out the door. Decide how you want to feel. And how do you want to feel this week? Not what you want to have happen, Regardless of what does or doesn't happen, how do you want to feel? What's the energy that you want to bring to your life in all that you do this week? intentions, we now move into our prayerful intentions, what we open to receive from the divine presence within. What are your prayerful intentions tonight? What do you open to receive? might go even deeper to see what is your soul's deepest intention in being here tonight. We fold all of these into our group prayer and intention, which is the healing of our minds, our restoration to joy, to sanity, to inner peace. We recognize that we have been drawn together this evening by the power and in the presence of God. And it is to God that we devote our time spent together as well as our relationships to one another, knowing that the Holy Spirit within us will so guide us in our thoughts and in our feelings and in our perceptions of all things 
that we may go to sleep tonight as happier, more peaceful, and more loving beings. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. Thank you for coming out in this heat wave. Oh my God, I was sweating all day. <clears throat> the guys, sort of, of us coming together here tonight was, are these two new books that I've written, but I don't know if we'll get to them. <laughs> but here they are. We'll try and get to them later <laughs> if we get a chance. I'd rather just talk to you. I'm really not talking to you anyhow. Don't take anything I say personally. I'm talking to myself. That's all I ever do. I go around for the last, tw you know, do you know, actually, this is crazy. This is the 15th anniversary of me speaking in San Diego. Yes, crazy as that is. Because uh, it, was, it was like 1999 in, I think, August when I came to Pacific Church when uh, everybody was at Asilomar and I came and guest spoke and was sort of drunk when I was talking still, actually. I was a little bit out all night the night before and gave two back-to-back -back services, just the same, because I thought, I'll never see these people again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you never know. <laughs> I used to talk to people in my lectures, and then I realized that that was just a horrible, stressful thing to do. And so what I do is I just talk to myself, and other people apparently like to listen in when I give myself a really good talking to. <laughs> and uh, that's really what all of life is meant to be, actually. I remember many years ago, uh, in the 80s, going to hear Marianne Williamson uh, talk. She said she, at that time, was lecturing a couple of times a week in Hollywood and on Saturday mornings, she said, sometimes people will come to me after a lecture on Saturday and say, I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. And she would say to them, listen, that's coming from you, not me. I never expect anyone to be at my lectures except me. So that's kind of your thing that you think that you're supposed to be here. I assume that if you're not here, you're somewhere else having a good time. But that was kind of around that time of when uh, there were certain seminars where you were really encouraged to get other people to come, <laughs> right? And so they sort of, that thing was kind of in the air, and she said, uh, to me, spirituality is not about enrolling people, it's about releasing people. So I want to start out with that tonight. The idea is that most of what spirituality is about is not gaining knowledge or gaining information or gaining anything. It is actually in many ways a loss, but it is, a, it is meant to be a gentle loss, a gentle surrender, though many of us let go with bloody stumps. <laughs> I did that for years. That's how I would let go. Uh, and so the Course in Miracles talks about that. It says, you know, it's not supposed to be painful, but it can be perceived as painful. And once you sort of get the point that this is really all about letting go, not holding on, not grabbing on. You know, all of metaphysics really could be described in a pamphlet. I mean, we have tons and tons of books that we read all the time, but it's, it all says the same stuff. I have almost every Joel Goldsmith book there is, and they all say exactly the same thing. I highlight them, highlight them, highlight them, and then I get rid of it and buy it again so I can re-highlight it. <laughs> it's not because the information is difficult. It's not because it's hard to understand or grasp. It's not because we're stupid. It's not because we're resistant. It's not because we're stubborn. It's because the whole world is built to hypnotize us to another way of thinking that is completely opposite to the idea that we're here to really release and let go and grace will carry us and all that stuff. So I always say, someone who's been studying this stuff for 20 years can leave a weekend seminar where they're high as a kite and they're one with God and they've let go of everything and they've forgiven all their exes and they're just absolutely, <laughs> completely, the business partner that stole all their money, they forgave them, they've let it all go and one episode of Sex in the City can ruin it. <laughs> 
It's like they never heard any of that stuff. It never happened. 15 minutes of CNN, I mean, anything can just erases it like from your mind. It's kind of like it's all written on an Etch-a-Sketch. It's like, oh, it's gone. What was, it's gone. It was there, now it's gone. So I never have new information, but I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again to myself because in the early metaphysicians, that was really kind of the phrase that they used. They talked about the hypnotism of the world, the mesmerism of the world. Ernest Holmes called it race thought. It was the, the dominant unconscious thought of the human race. And so what A Course in Miracles says is that miracles don't do anything, miracles undo. And so actually in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you and I are the same. I don't have something more than what you have. What I have is less than what you have. I have everything the Father gave me and nothing else. You have everything the Father gave you and then what your grade school teacher said and then what CNN said and then what you read in that pan, you know, all, you have all this extra stuff. So that the miracles are the undoing, the constant unlayering and undoing. And so that's why we say, I hope that you don't get anything out of this. <laughs> I don't want you to leave here with more than you had when you come in. I want you to come here with less than you had when you came in here. That's really the essence of it, is that we have so much information and most of it is just BS. <laughs> right? And we're so clever. I call it, uh, you know, a lot of the teachings of Jesus were paradoxes. I call it opposite world. I live in opposite world, that everything, you know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first and all of those things are so true. It's hard to, that's why I'm not talking to you, I'm just talking to me because you'd be crazy to listen to me, frankly. <laughs> everything that I'm about to say tonight, you'd be crazy to do any of it because it's gonna go against everything that makes any kind of sense in the world. I, I say, I'm here because I don't mind being an absolute failure. I am a public failure. People in New Thought hate that. They get so upset, don't say that. <laughs> oh no, I'm a success, I'm a winner. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you have to understand how I mean that. What I mean by that is that everything I have ever touched turns to shit. Anytime I've gone into a situation to make money, I've ended up in debt. Anytime I've gone looking for a relationship, they've run from me like my hair is on fire. Anytime I've tried to lose weight, I've gained 20 pounds. Anytime I've tried to get healthy, I end up sick as a dog. Everything that I try to do falls apart. And what I realized many, many years ago, and now it's just an essence of practicing it and owning it as much as possible, is that the problem in my life is me. And I would suggest it's possible that the problem in your life might be you. <laughs> Just saying, maybe. <laughs> and that the less that I have to do with my life, the better my life goes. <laughs> and I really do have the attitude of, hey, I just work here. <laughs> I just work here. <laughs> Sent by God, I just work here. And The Course in Miracles has a whole little section about that. It says, I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here to represent him who sent me. I don't have to know what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I'm content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. So you just show, this is my, sort of my motto in life that I tell people all the time is, I show up prepared on time, doing what I said I would do with a good attitude. Everything else is out of my hands. And guess what? Everything else is out of your hands too. <laughs> The idea that we can control the future. So much of new thought got confused like we were gonna control the future. Well, a lot of new thought got bastardized in the 70s and 80s because it got mixed in with a lot of other stuff. And so it became this thing of you create your own reality and you can make it happen and you're in charge and you can have anything you want. And we all know you can't have anything you want. <laughs> Ernest Holmes is crystal clear about that. There's a, uh, if you ever get that live CD where they have him talking live, have you ever 
heard that? It's great. He says right on there in one of the live talks, he says, this is not a philosophy that says that you can have what you want when you want it. If we could all have what we want when we wanted it, we wouldn't get out of this theater alive. <laughs> he said, we would not survive because none of us has any sense. <laughs> and he says in the Science of Mind text, he, talk, he says, you know, this is not a philosophy of something for nothing. It's not about name it and claim it. But he does say that there is something to this idea that if we are thinking in the right direction, that it does open the channels for more good. And that it's not about what happens in our lives. One of the things that he says in there that I love so much is he says, if every day you are just feeling a little better, you're on the right track. That's all. If you just feel a little more open, a little more peace, a little more positive, you're going in the right direction. And that's all I care about anymore, frankly. All I care about now is, am I going in the right direction? This is really something that's been huge for me in the last year or so. Because, well, first of all, we live in a society that's all in a real hurry all the time. We're just really, really, as, as Carrie Fisher says, instant gratification takes too long. <laughs> we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> So we're in such a hurry, but oftentimes we're in a rush and we're going totally the wrong way. And so the idea for me is not when am I going to get there or what's the destination so much as it is, am I moving in the right direction? And the right direction, of course, in spiritual terms, has to do really with how much peace and love and joy are you experiencing? That's really the only message that I have is about peace and joy and love. Peace and joy and love, peace and joy and love, peace and joy and love. That's it. I have no idea how you can get what you want. I don't know how you can get a man or a job or a house or get healthy. I don't have any idea. But this is what I've discovered for myself, is that I can't make anything better but I can make shit way worse. <laughs> and so if you come in many ways from a path of radical non-interference, then what you find is things begin to move in the right direction that a lot of us trying to make things work and make things happen actually just interferes with the process. And so I've learned this over the, really a lot over the last five years of anything I have turned to to fix or heal has gotten worse. That's how I make it worse is by trying to just fix it in some way. So what then is the point? Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> Jacob, tell us. What's the point of treatment? What's the point of prayer? What's the point of affirmations? What's the point of all that stuff? Well, see, this actually this book, The Miracle Worker's Handbook, is, is kind of a reissue in a way of my first book, Invocations. And one of the reasons that, and actually, this, I do a lot of stuff now just to amuse myself. <laughs> but I said for years that invocations, a lot of people were like, what invocations? And so, it's like 47 spiritual mind treatments. So they're affirmative prayer. But what people get confused about sometimes, I think, with affirmative prayer is thinking that affirmative prayer makes things happen. Affirmative prayer doesn't make anything happen. The prayer makes you feel good. That's all it's supposed to do. That's all it's supposed to do. It just changes your consciousness. That's why Ernest Holmes would constantly, and so does Joel Goldsmith, both of them are constantly saying, the treatment never leaves the mind of the practitioner. The Course in Miracles says, ideas do not leave their source. You are not sending a thought out to the universe and then the universe is bringing something back to you. That is not what is happening. But when you feel good, you are at the frequency of feel-good stuff. Right? When you watch Channel 6, you won't see any of the stuff that's on Channel 4. That's how that works. It's pretty simple. 
So when we do a spiritual mind treatment or prayer, it makes us feel good so that then we're at, on the frequency of that channel. So we're only going to see what's on that channel, right? That's what treatment does. So the original name of the book was Invocations. I said, but people thought like it was going to do something magical in their lives. Like, I'm going to say this prayer dream for prosperity. Money's going to come pouring out. I said, it's not incantations. <laughs> It's invocations. <laughs> so then when I did the new version of it, I did the prayers, I said, I'm putting a magic wand on the cover, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a real life experience of that. Last week, I went to the farmer's market that's just up on Sunset Boulevard above where I live. And I went there. I was very, very happy because I was there to get ice cream. Right? So I'm seeing everything on the ice cream channel frequency. <laughs> That's the world I am living in, is the swirl from the ice cream truck at the farmer's market. And so I, I thought, well, I'm going to walk sort of the long way home because it was such a nice night. And so I'm walking, and then I see, I'm, I'm walking down Sunset, and this guy is coming towards me, and his dog is going crazy like pulling him and barking at this, and he's got sort of a big dog that's barking and barking, and, can't, and I can't see, he's coming toward, I can't see what the dog is barking at back there. I thought, well, he, the dog is sort of crazy because there's nothing there. But I came around this thing, and I saw that there was another guy standing there with his dog. So the dog was barking at this guy's dog, and so I came up behind him, we were gonna cross sunset. And so I was right behind him, so he was all upset because of the dog. And he said to me, he looked at me and said, that dog is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, odd. OK. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, that dog is an asshole, but not as big an asshole as the owner. So he was all upset. And I'm still on Ice Cream Channel. <laughs> it really sucks to be you. You know, like. Um, so then we start, so the light turns, and then we're walking, and I'm walking behind him. We're going the same direction. And he's, you know, however many feet in front of me. So as he goes, one of the big tour buses that's, you know, pointing out where everybody died, because it was right by the Viper Room and all this stuff, and they're pointing out. So they don't see him, they almost hit him. So then he's like, why are you? <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> so <laughs> walking down. And then we get to the next little side street, and somebody pulls out from uh, the London Hotel, is coming from out of the garage, and they don't see him, and they almost hit him. And then he's like, what are you doing? And, and he looks like a perfectly normal guy. You know, he doesn't look like somebody you'd look at and go, this guy is a lunatic. He just looked like a normal guy who was in hell. Right? Just, this is the worst day ever. And it just made me think of that, of like, here we are walking the exact same path at the exact same time in two completely different worlds. Because the better it gets, the better it gets, and the worse it gets, the worse it gets. Because that's just the way energy flows. That's inertia. Inertia is the tendency of the object to go in whatever direction it's been going. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. And it will go in the direction it's been going unless there is a counter force to move it in a different direction. So that's why this movement is called New Thought. <laughs> Mary Manon Morrissey always says, we call this movement New Thought, but when's the last time you had one? <laughs> Because most of our thoughts, the vast majority of our thoughts, are repetitive and negative. And most new thought people think they're very positive. And if you talk to them, you're like, well, you should listen to yourself. <laughs> because if a tooth fell out of your head every time you said something negative, <laughs> you'd be toothless. <laughs> but we don't think we're being negative. We're just telling it like it is. I'm just describing what happened. 
And so really, that's, I mean, that's really what both of these books are. In, in essence, the book You Were Born for Greatness is, is uh, it's the third in the series of the angel books that I've written. And all it is, they're just, it's called a plop book, I say, because you can just plop it open to any page, and each entry is like maybe a page, page and a half, two pages, something like that. And the purpose of it is simply to soothe you. That's all it is. It's just to soothe you. It's just to make you feel better, even if your life is going to hell. <laughs> to feel better. Because here's the, here's the secret. This is what the ego doesn't want us to know, is that we think that if we get upset enough about our life going to hell, we can stop it. <laughs> but that what really stops your life from going to hell is starting to feel better while your life is going to hell. Just a little bit better. Just a little bit better. I had a friend who used to say, if they're running you out of town, get way in front and call it a parade. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's attitude. <laughs> That's like, I just make it up the way that it works for me. Because too many times people get into new thought and think that all of this affirmations and treasure mapping and visualizing and all these things are something that they're not. The purpose of all of them is just to feel good and shift your consciousness, not to make something happen or prevent something from happening. It's almost like people think, well, I'll be able to stop having problems if I do this stuff. No, 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 no. As Marianne Williamson used to say, when you get into a spiritual life, it doesn't mean the end of all the drama in your life, it's the end of all the cheap drama. <laughs> right? It's all that, you know, it's all the cheap drama that goes away, but it's not that suddenly everything goes your way the way you want it to all the time and nobody upsets you or anything like that, it's that you stop being someone who dramatizes all the problems and who is completely unaware. You know, that's part of our growth process is to realize that a lot of the stuff that happens comes from shit that we say. Oh, I just said blah, 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 and she became hysterical. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and then, that, you know, at some point, if you do enough of this work, you think, you know, you don't have to share every thought that drops into your head with people in the name of honesty. Some things you could just really keep to yourself and be okay. And so, okay, so I want to read actually something here from uh, I Stand on Holy Ground on this Joel Goldsmith book. <laughs> I come to talk about my books and read from other people's books. <laughs> A Lesson on Grace. Many persons turn to truth pri primarily for the purpose of finding a way to solve their human problems. And then, maybe I better just, here. I don't know if it's the light. Oh, no, that's good. Many persons turn to truth primarily for the purpose of finding a way to solve their human problems and then proceed to measure their spiritual pro progress by how many problems they do not have. That's called an annoying person. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you. I'm clear as a bell. This is a false measuring rod, although there undoubtedly does come a time when the complete absence of problems may mean spiritual demonstration or harmony attained. Jesus attained that after the crucifixion and the resurrection. After. <laughs> okay, after. <laughs> a lot of problems right up to the very end. After. Too many students, however, are trying to attain it before the crucifixion and before the demonstration of resurrection. It cannot be accomplished. It must be understood clearly that the demonstration over the beliefs of what we will call the human or carnal mind must be made before complete liberation can be attained. It is always a cause for rejoicing, therefore, when we are presented with problems and are able to resolve them. There was a time when I dreamed of having $100,000. I wanted that amount because the income from it would make me independent, and then I would be a practitioner without any worries. The day I became a practitioner, I had exactly $250 in the world and no human way of getting any more. 
That has been my salvation, because now when I speak about demonstrating supply, I'm not speaking from some textbook I have read or even passed an examination on. I'm speaking from the experience of having proved the principle of supply. When I speak about health, I'm not speaking from the pages of book that I've read. I'm speaking out of personal experience. In 1921, I was given three months to live by physicians in St. Luke's Hospital in New York City, and many years later, I was given only a few hours to live. So twice I've come back from the experience of imminent death, and both times through spiritual demonstration. What I love about this with Joel Goldsmith is he did this a couple of times because he, he had this in his head of like, if I just had $100,000. So he would get to very close to $100,000, then he'd lose it all. So a couple of times he'd think, I, I got $100,000, and then, then it's all gone. So what he's saying here is that the mastery over spiritual supply was in the recognition that spirit is the supply daily. He's somebody who will talk a lot of times about um, not hoarding manna, right? That's from Moses' time in the desert, not hoarding manna. So his idea was, I'll have, see, we think this a lot of times. It's like, you know, oh, I trust God, you know, and $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, I trust God, but the hundred thousand dollars allows me to trust God. <laughs> right? That's not really trusting God now, is that? Because clearly, the hundred thousand dollars is your God. Right? And we have to look to see what is our God. Really, we've been talking lately in my classes about seeking the face of God, not the hand of God. Right? Gimme, 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 gimme. I need, I need this. I need to be healed. And I need my sister to get off the drugs. And I need that. Wait a minute. Let's just get into the presence of God. In the presence of God, there's the peace and the joy and the love. And we begin to release all of these false gods, what the Course in Miracles calls the idols that are made to replace God. In fact, there were years ago in one of Marianne's lectures in LA, I wasn't even there, but I heard it on a tape. I'll never forget the woman's name was Gloria. I didn't even hear the story, but Marianne talked about it for years where there was some woman during the question period who basically had said, so, I don't even know how it came up, but somewhere in the talk, it came up and she was talking. And the, so for years, Marianne would say, she would say, well, it's like Gloria who trusts God up to $100,000. Because, you know, that's the, the FDIC, the $100,000. <laughs> You're insured up to, then after that, hey, I better take over. So that's the God, then your insurance is your God. The house is my God. It's the thing of, I have to have this. And what I will present to you tonight, which I present to myself all the time, is the idea that the thing that you have to have is the thing that's blocking you. Whatever the thing is that you have to have. Somebody sent me uh, an email recently, somebody who gets the CDs who lives, I think, actually out of the country, because I send them to Florida, and then someone sends them to her, I don't know where. But she wrote me this, and she had been having an affair with a married man for a while. Not unusual. <laughs> Happens all the time. They had broken up recently, and she, now she's somebody who's been studying this stuff for years, so it's not the ideas presented. And certainly, I think she found me through the Course in Miracles, so she's very familiar with the Course in Miracles. And she said, in this email, she said, I'm suffering because when I am not in a romantic relationship, I feel empty inside. All right. Has anyone ever heard of something like that? <laughs> I feel empty inside. So I'll make sure. So, <clears throat> so I wrote her back and I said, well, first of all, The Course in Miracles is almost about nothing else but that. It's practically about nothing else but the pain of the ego's use of relationships. And what is fascinating about this to me in particular is that the people who most, see, the special relationship in terms of A Course in Miracles is anything that you think you need in order to be happy. So the biggest way that the ego uses that is with a mate. I need a partner. Even that word is so ridiculous. My partner. My partner. 
God is your partner. You don't need a human partner. If you think you need a human partner, then you're already so insane and screwed. <laughs> a partner. Because that says, I need someone else so we can get through this life. <laughs> this is another thing Marianne used to say. It's like that song, You and Me Against the World. She said, if any man ever said to me, baby, it's you and me against the world, I would switch sides. <laughs> We are outnumbered. <laughs> but it's that like my partner in life. And something you hear a lot now, too. You see this, if you ever watch those horrific reality shows, with, uh, especially with the housewives, because this is something you will hear them say. It's so insane. So they will say it to their mates, but they'll also say to their girlfriends a lot, you didn't have my back. Do you have my back? I need you to have my back. Do you have my back? <laughs> How this got into the popular vernacular, I have no idea, because the only people that need to have someone who has their back are police officers and people in war. <laughs> if you are in your personal life someone who needs someone to have your back, you're the problem. <laughs> It means you act in such a way <laughs> that someone's after you. <laughs> so this is one of the lessons in the courses. God is my refuge and security. And so the special relationship is most empowered in many ways with that idea of I need a partner and a mate. But it's anything. So a lot of us, you know, realized, OK, well, OK, that is, I understand that's it. So we just transferred it to something else. OK, well, no, it's not going to be a mate that's going to fulfill me. It's going to be my work. So now my career has become a special relationship. I need to have a certain kind of career. My business card looks, needs to be like this. And I need to be a success in a certain way. People need to think of me in a certain way. Or maybe it's going to be my body. I need to have a body that people admire, that looks really healthy, and that I can count on, and that does everything that I need for it to do. Or I need this or this. But they're all the same thing. It's all something out there that's going to save me. So I said, so she said, I have this feeling. I said, well, that's. Nothing unusual about that, that you feel. But what I started to say a minute ago is, it's so amazing to me that the people who are most tied into that idea of, I feel empty if I'm not in a romantic relationship, usually are people who have not had good relationships. Have you ever noticed that? Like, people who have just good relationships don't have that thing of sometimes they're single for a couple years, and they're fine, and then they get into a relationship. But it's the people who really want one. Now, you start to see how sick the mind is then, right? I have these really painful, disturbing relationships, and I need one. <laughs> right? It's like you go, what? <laughs> I don't understand that. So, and the course talks, because the course makes fun of us all the time about stuff like that. It says, because it, when it talks about judgment, it says, you know, you're not really capable of being tired, but you're perfectly capable of wearying yourself. The strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. It says, it is curious that such a debilitating habit would be so cherished. <laughs> <laughs> but we do. It's like, oh, this brings me a lot of pain, but I need it. So I said, so the, I said, you're not unusual. There's nothing to be embarrassed about that you have that feeling. But that is an insane thought. And of course, you have the feel. This goes to Byron Katie now, those of us who've done the Byron Katie work, is, is you start to question those crazy thoughts. You don't question the feeling. You question the thought. That's something that Katie will say to people. They'll say, well, I feel this way. And she'll say, of course you feel that way, because you believe the thought. Your thoughts make you feel a certain way. So you don't question the feeling. You question the thought. So you don't say, OK, I feel empty without a romantic relationship. Is it true? That's not what you question. You question the thought. I'm empty without a romantic relationship. Is that true? Of course. Immediately, you know that's not true. If you just inquire within, you can see I'm filled with many wonderful things. It's just a thought. and it's. A thought that's part of the hypnotism of the world. That's why I say you can do the Course in Miracles and the workbook and all this stuff for 20 years and watch one episode of Sex in the City. It goes whoosh, out the door. 
right? Because everything is built towards the idea that you are really lacking in many different ways. So it just depends on what the hook is for you, whether it's I need a romantic relationship or I should be more educated or why do I weigh this much? Well, how did I get this old? <laughs> <laughs> right? Why don't I have more money? You know that whole thing about $100,000. If I just had $100,000, and you realize that these things are idols because they're false gods. If I just had that, then I would be okay. In fact, um, it reminded me of that when the housing bust happened and everybody was, you know, the all just just the turmoil of that and how horrible that was for so many people. Uh, Oprah had a show where she had Susie Orman on and all the people in the audience were people who'd lost their homes. And there was a minister in the front row with his wife and the wife was saying that he'd gotten so depressed because they had lost their 401k. And he had worked, they were ready to retire. He had been a minister for many years all their retirement was wiped out and they because they were just getting ready to I think maybe they had bought like a mobile home they were going to travel around and stuff like that but they lost all their savings just like that and so they were screwed basically and he had gotten so depressed that he was practically suicidal and I mean when that was on I was like I mean his story was this is what this is what I want you to really get to his story was I did what you're supposed to do. I was a minister. I served other people my whole life. I took care of my family. I saved money like you're supposed to. I did everything the way you're supposed to do it. And it was all wiped out. So he felt betrayed by everything. The, the American dream had betrayed him. The financial institutions had betrayed him. But more than that, God had betrayed him. But that should have been the awakening right there that God was not God to him. That retirement fund was God to him. When that was gone, his faith went out the window, right? That was what was positive in many ways about that experience is that when you are destroyed by that story, hopefully you realize Oh, it's not because, it's for one reason and one reason only, the story is bullshit. <laughs> so many people, when this was happening, were trying to get to the place of, when are we going to get, we need to get back to where we were. <sighs> That's like saying, we just woke up from this nightmare, I need to go back to sleep to get back in that nightmare. <laughs> right? It's not going to go back to the way it was. The way it was was unworkable. That's the thing is to begin to question because that's a lie. The lie that if you do the right thing and live right and do what you're supposed to do, everything will turn out. Well, that is just a lie. I remember, this is another thing that Marianne said that was so great where she said, you know, there's this false idea somehow in spirituality now that if you, that everything comes back just the way it went out. So it's like, well, if I put out a lot of angry energy and a lot of negativity and a lot of attack, then what I will get back is attack. But if I put out a lot of love and a lot of kindness and a lot of goodness, then what I will get back is attack. <laughs> Why? Because that's all the world does. That's all the world does is attack. There's nobody who put, listen, if you take the people, even just in the, the big people that we think of, if you take, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Jesus, people who had a message of kindness and love. <laughs> what came back? <laughs> Was it a nice house on the hill? <laughs> right? So the message of Jesus in the Course in Miracles as well as in the scripture was not that bad things didn't happen, it's that he did not perceive them as bad. In The Course in Miracles, he says, to you, I was beaten, abandoned, and betrayed, but I do not share that perception. Right? He didn't hang on the cross and look down and go, you'll burn. 
<laughs> he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. Right? He's saying, you don't need, you, you think this is the story. This is not the story. So this is the power. This is what the real power is. It's the power. This is why we do this at the beginning when I do the meditations all the time. I say, decide now how you're going to feel when you leave here tonight. Decide how you're going to feel this week. The ego says, we'll see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. We'll see. Right? <laughs> Things are to my liking. We'll have a good day. <laughs> right? There's no power in that. There is no power in that at all. That is still victim mentality. It's just a higher kind of victim mentality. When things go my way, I'm happy. That's still victim mentality because it's saying that the outside things are what run my inner world. Right? Real power is I take my own emotional journey. I don't like everything that happens, but I know how to deal with my mind to begin moving in a better direction. Doesn't mean I'm happy, happy, joy, joy all the time, but I know that when things are going in a direction that I don't want them to, that I need to work on myself. The universe isn't going to send me a present. I used to wait for presents. <laughs> right? That's like, I'm doing all the right stuff. I have a feeling there's a, probably a present coming. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's been really hard lately, but I've been really kind, and I have not gone off, and I haven't judged, and I've been really nice, I feel like somebody is going to help me soon. Right? This is why we say, no one is on the way. No, stop waiting. You can call off the search, bring in the dogs, it's over. No one's coming. Right? We're the ones. We're the ones. So I realized at a certain point, if you want a present, it's up to you. Give yourself a present, right? whatever it is. Because oftentimes the present is not a thing. It's, I want someone to say, you have been really good lately. <laughs> right? And plus, you look like you're 35. <laughs> right? That you have to be the one to say, this is all that Louise Hay work all the time, you know, where you look in the mirror. You know, if you, a couple of years ago, I did, a, I called it May Mental Makeover Month, and so one of the assignments was every week to watch the DVD of You Can Heal Your Life, because she made that movie of You Can Heal Your Life, and part of that was people who were being interviewed at Hay House conferences and stuff and talking about using affirmations and stuff. And so much of Louise's stuff is about self-love, which is really what it all comes down to anyhow. And so this woman said, it was great, she said, when I first started working with, uh, with affirmations and stuff that Louise was teaching, there was an affirmation where you look in the mirror and you would say, I love and approve of myself. And she said, I could not remember. Every single day I would look in the mirror, I love and... Uh, what? It's the other thing. She could never remember the other thing. I love and, uh, right? I mean, that should tell you the block that we have. <laughs> like, I love and, uh, I don't know, something. Something. I love something myself. Right? Because I tell people all the time, no one can give you what you are unwilling to give yourself. Just as the Course of Miracles says, ideas do not leave their source. Louise Hay says all the time, no one else is thinking in your head. That's all you. <laughs> but it's not all the real you. It's, uh, in fact, one of the things that the Course of Miracles says, and Joel Goldsmith talks about this a lot, but one of the aspects of the Course where it says, those are not your thoughts. That's what, what Joel Goldsmith calls the carnal mind, what Ernest Holmes calls race thought. It's all of that that's in the collective unconscious, all of that stuff that's been going on for millennia after millennia that's filled with attack and self-doubt and all of that stuff. But don't take it personally. Right? When we take it personally, like, I, oh, I have low self-esteem and I have this and that. Nah. <laughs> it's just something that goes through the mind. Don't pay any attention to it. When you pay attention to it, then you activate it. 
how can I get rid of this activates whatever you're trying to get rid of. It just makes it stronger. That's why I always tell people, love your fat. It will leave you. <laughs> right? Ask it for a commitment. It'll be gone in the morning. <laughs> Right? Because everything we resist persists. You know, you hate your body the way it is. It's like it just solidifies as that. Whatever it is that you hate and resist, you've just solidified it as that by giving it all of your attention. The idea here, with certainly with The Course in Miracles, when we talk about peace and joy and love, is that those are things that are already within us. They just need to be activated. That's all. They just need... We're not going to get the peace of God. We're not going to get joy. We're not going to get love. They're things that are activated by us consciously activating them. That's what the prayers and all of those things are for, of I'm activating this within myself. That's why, you know, prayer treatment is never petitionary. It doesn't say, oh, God, please do this. This is one of the things that Joel Goldsmith is really adamant about. And Ernest Holmes is saying the same thing, but he's less belligerent than Joel Goldsmith. <laughs> and, you know, so I like both of them, because Ernest is much more gentle and loving, and it's open at the top, and Joel is more like in your face. <laughs> so in his books, he will say all the time, he will go on and on and on about how no prayer that's ever been prayed in all the churches, in metaphysical churches, has ever had any effect at all. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I mean, seriously. If you understand what he means by that, when it's like praying that God will stop this war, that it will save this baby, that there's no Santa Claus God who's doing shit. <laughs> you can just save your breath. Right? I mean, this is what all metaphysics, there's no God who does anything. There's no God who's doing anything. This is, I mean, the beginning of the movement, really, it, as far as organizing it, was Mary Baker Eddy. And she says in the first couple of pages, she says, she basically says, is man sufficient to instruct God into what to do? <laughs> Hasn't he already done everything? She said, that's like going up to the blackboard and praying for mathematics to solve the problem. <laughs> you use mathematics to solve the problem yourself. That's why Paul said, work out your own salvation. No spirit is going to do anything for you. We have the law. And the law is, if I guide my mind, I will move in consciousness. And as I move in consciousness, then my world begins to reflect whatever consciousness I am in. And that is an ever-moving thing, right? It's an ever-moving thing. And it's an area thing, too because you have different consciousness in different areas, right? You may have great health consciousness and great wealth consciousness and not so great family consciousness, right? So you don't work on your family, you work on your mind, right? The difference between the special relationship and the holy relationship is this, and if you're taking notes, write this down. <laughs> In the, holy, in the special relationship, you are always working on the relationship. In the holy relationship, you're just working on yourself. That's it. You're not working on the other person. You're not shaping them up. <laughs> I've almost got them now where they need to be. Right? <clears throat> so you start to realize... One of the things that we do that's so insane is we t all of this is so simple, and I'm even going to say it's actually easy, but we make it hard. We say it's hard because we don't realize we're making it hard. And a lot of that comes from, you know, it boils down in many ways to that line in The Course of Miracles that says, do you prefer that you be right or happy? A friend Yolanda years ago, this was in practitioner class in Los Angeles, and we did a lot of horrible sharing in that class. God, I hated that class. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> we had to share all the time. And so regular practitioner classes are so much better than the hell 
ministry of practitioner classes that I went through in LA. And we would all share, and Yolanda, who was usually next to me, <laughs> was so wonderfully insane. And she was sharing with us one night about a big fight that she was having with her ex-husband at the time and how she was screaming at him, I don't want you to tell me I'm right because you want me to shut up. I want you to tell me I'm right because I am right. <laughs> okay? That's the special relationship. It's like, it's not just that I want to get what I want. I want to get it the way I want to get it. Like, we're very particular about these things. All of this, you know... Relationships, I mean, that's all it is. That's all anything is, is relationships. Everything is just relationships. If we can just soften around relationship and release and release instead of trying to fix and change and save, I can't save anybody. I have saved some people almost to death. <laughs> I don't save anyone anymore. I don't help anyone anymore. I never help anyone anymore. What I do is, is I do what brings me joy, and I save and help myself if I can. And what I've noticed is that then other people around me will help and save themselves. That's why the, one of the cornerstones of the Course in Miracles says, it is the sole responsibility of the miracle worker to accept the atonement for himself. Too many times we get involved in this stuff, and then we try, then we take on everyone in our family as a project. Right? Oh, I read this book. You and really, you really should read this book because you really. <laughs> right? Stop saving me. I think it was Thoreau who said, "If I knew for a fact that a man was on his way over to my house to help me, I would run for my life." <laughs> so I used to try to help people. I used to try. I used to years ago. I would try to speak to groups and I would try to serve the group. Never try to serve anyone. Don't try to serve your clients, your customers. Never try to do any of that stuff. What you do is you just come from joy, and you will attract people who are satisfied with you exactly the way you are. When I used to try to please people in the groups, what I found out was people are assholes. <laughs> And the more I would try to please them, the more they would bitch and complain bitterly. And the more I would do for them, the less satisfied they were. And then when I finally said, you know what, I'm done. I'm just showing up for me, and I'm doing what I like to do, and people who want that will come. And if it's just me and the four walls, I'm good with that. And I started telling people, this was in 2005, when I thought I was actually quitting this. I was like, I'm going to do it the way I want, and that, nobody's going to put up with that crap. <laughs> so I would move to LA. I was going to get a job in a, like, in a little office or something and just lecture on the weekends. I was driving down at that time on Sunday mornings to Park Manor Suites, and there was a little room there. And I was like, and it, this room, when, we, when I found this room, what a dump. <laughs> and I loved that about it. Because for years it had been, I want to speak in a pretty room. And I was like, Jacob, you're just a big whore for a pretty room. <laughs> like all the things you'll do to have a pretty room means that really you're not about the thing, you're about the room. Right? That's another thing. That's your God, the thing that I need it to look and be in this and that. You know something you see on these reality shows too with um, a lot of times you'll see this with People who, people who are having parties or people who are getting married, it has to be perfect. I'm like, you're so screwed. <laughs> right? Because what that says is that what matters is not the content, it's the form. It doesn't matter that we're having this party to celebrate so and so. It doesn't matter that I'm getting married to the love of my life. What matters is what other people will think about all this. So I'd done this thing for rooms for a long time. I realized that in a lot of ways it was just miserable. And the more you tried to please people, the more unhappy they were. And the more that you try to please other people, the more you're leaving your own center. One of the things that the Tao Te Ching says is the further the man go, a man goes from himself, the less he knows. So as soon as you're starting to step out and say, I'm going to do this for other people, you've already started to leave your center. Right? So 
when we got to the room in Park Manor Suites, it was kind of a dump. And I was like, I love it, because nobody will be here for anything but the right reason. There was an air conditioner that blew hot air into the room. <laughs> the, the level R's were plastic, broken, and dirty. It was old chair. When we first got there, it was just one of the suites. But they used it as a meeting room. So it had a big, ugly leather sofa and a coffee table and a china hutch. And we were all sort of crammed in, in these chairs. And it was hot. And I was like, this is it. I love it. There's nobody here for anything but what I have to give. And I start saying, there's no hugging afterwards. You can't talk to me. What you get for $15 is a lecture, two meditations, and then when I'm done, all I want to see is your ass going that way. <laughs> $15 at the door does not make me your bitch. <laughs> no stories, no hugging me and telling going to your story. We're done. That's it. And I thought, nobody's going to come to that. Nobody. We. Before you knew it, we were packed to the walls. People were standing out in the hallways for me to yell at them every week. <laughs> right? Because I was pleasing myself and doing what I said. I was showing up, prepared, on time, doing what I said I would do with a good attitude. Then I attracted people who were pleased with that. And if somebody complained about something, my thing was, this is not the group for you. Because I start saying, this is the ministry of you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ministry of you are on your own. That's what New Thought is. New Thought is, so there was a time when New Thought went through this thing where it just attracted wounded people who came and never got better. Because you'd just be able, no one would say, shut up. How much time do I have left? Two hours. All right. It's a long CD. Okay. I want to read this from, this is from Edwin Gaines' book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity. I will be eternally grateful for a teacher who one day abruptly called me on my act. As I once again began my tale of woe, he said, listen, toots, this victim stuff has gone on far enough. It's really a drag, and it's boring the tears out of the rest of us. So now I'm assuming this was not the second or third time she told that story. <laughs> I can tell you this is somebody who was the speaker for many, many, many years. The story that someone tells you is not new. The story that someone comes up crying and telling you, it's just different people. But the people who are doing that all the time, it's just different faces, different places, but really same story. I was shocked. He had not given me the poor baby response that I'd come to expect. As I gasped, he continued, in order to heal this childhood trauma, what you've got to do is create a new story about it. He paused and gave it some thought. OK, here's your new story. Try this one on and see if it works for you. You came onto this planet to be a woman of power. Your soul chose this pathway, and because you chose it, you also chose to take an initiation in the misuse of power at a very young age. During this initiation, you learned what it feels like when power is misused, and it is horrible. Therefore, it is now safe for you to be a woman of power in the world, because you know now that you would never misuse or abuse this power. And in this process, you have gained the most valuable of all spiritual gifts, the understanding heart. My world reeled from this and cracked open a bit. It didn't happen overnight, but little by little, one day at a time, I began to embrace this wonderful new story, a saga that completely reordered my personal history. It made me feel powerful rather than helpless, and it allowed me to give up the role of victim. Now, the story that he gave her is not the point, because you could tell any story. The point is to tell a story that makes you feel soothed, something that doesn't keep activating the old wound. Because when you feel good, you're open to good. When you feel like a victim, you're open to victim. When you're watching Channel 6, you'll only see what's on Channel 6. And you'll be pissed that Channel 6 keeps showing that. I hate Channel 6. Why do they show this crap all the time? Don't they understand about what's happened to me? There's no compassion on Channel 6. I'm going to pick a Channel 6. I'm going to write a book about Channel 6. I'm going to the press about Channel 6. 
right? <laughs> How about I'm just going to tell a better story and turn to channel four? I'm just going to turn to channel. I'm going to stop trying to figure all this stuff out. That's why when you realize, see, that's sometimes the thing, too, is when people get into this thing of, I create my own reality. I have to think certain thoughts so that I can make stuff happen. That's the level of mental law. And that is a very powerful place to be. But there's so much beyond that. You'll never not need mental law. But too many of us start to dominate with that or don't or we go into a place beyond that and then we don't use mental law and neither one of those works I always say you can leave mental law behind and go into grace and what happens then is you just become a victim of God I did that for years where I said well I don't make choices and I just surrender to God and I don't choose anything and I don't say what I want and I don't have any goals and just whatever God wants then you're just a victim of God and since God's not doing anything anyhow, you become a victim of nothing. <laughs> and all that's really happening is you're being run secretly by your subconscious thinking. So that means we always have to be conscious of what we're thinking. But not at the level where we're always trying to mentally figure everything out. That's why if we think like, well, I have this problem I need to figure out. How did I create that? How did I cause that? Why don't you just forget that crap? Just forget that crap, because then all you're ever doing is thinking, what did I, how did I, why did I do this? Maybe I said this, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have watched that TV program. Maybe I what I doing. Okay, you will drive yourself insane. Insane. Instead of just going, how can I release the attachment to this story and just soothe myself to a better feeling place? How can I just massage my thoughts and decide, OK, this is how I feel, but how do I want to feel? Right? This is how I feel. That's great. That's admitting it. I feel depressed. I feel angry. I feel powerless. I feel afraid. Then you get that out. But once you're done, then you don't have to. The problem is, is we keep then telling everybody, did I tell you how I feel? <laughs> right? We don't just stop and say, this is how I feel now. This is how I want to feel. Right? That's the process. Is you say how you feel, then you say how I want to feel. We don't know how you're going to feel that way, but you set the destination. Seneca said, if a man does not know what harbor he's making for, no wind is the right wind. So if you've set the goal, I want peace. I want joy. I want to feel free. I want to feel happy. I want to feel good in my body. I want to feel good in my life. I want to feel happy in my relationships. I don't know how to make that happen, but that's my goal. So. Once you give the mind a goal, the mind begins to gather evidence. It begins to gather evidence for whatever the goal was. So it will start to notice the people that are friendly, the gifts of the universe. So you start to keep track of them. That's the daily pages I do. I have all these lists, these endless lists of what went right in the last 24 hours, where I got it right in the last 24 hours, what's great about today, what I'm thankful for, what I love. What are my intentions for today? And my intentions for each day are usually about how I want to feel, right? I want to be happy. I want to be useful. I want to live in the grace and go of God. I want to have a wonderful, joyful drive to and from San Diego and have a wonderful class. I want to come from just a centered, peaceful place, right? That you set the intention at the beginning of the day, right? Then the mind knows, oh, that's where we're going. Great. That's where we're going. Okay, now, I want to finish reading. Do I really have more time left? You're about uh, six, seven minutes. Okay. I can sort of wrap that up. Okay. It also brought to mind the coaching of another teacher who told me, never ask a why question. There are no absolute answers to why questions, but if you absolutely have to ask why, at least have the good sense to make up an answer that pleases you. <laughs> That's so awesome. There was a teacher of ours who used to say, who used, she wouldn't answer why questions because she said, why is always looking for guilt. The ego is always looking through why to find guilt because the ego doesn't care who's guilty, just so somebody is. I had a friend who years ago was, she'd gone into business with a friend, they did an infomercial, they created a product, and then, and then, and she brought in other people in it, and they all sort of 
at least the way she felt, betrayed her. And she ended up with nothing, and they ended up with money, and they just sort of cut her free. And she was miserable for months. And she'd call me on the phone, she'd go on and on and on. And I finally said to her one day, I'm gonna give you an assignment that I think is really gonna help you. For the next six months, I want you to remove the word why from your vocabulary. Because this was what tormented her more than anything else, was why did they do it? Why did they betray me? After all I did, the, why? They, and this is it in general. Why can't I make any money? Why can't I get healthy? Why did my father abuse me? Why was it? All of that, just forget it. It will keep you in hell forever to try to figure out why. Why is the wrong question. Why did this happen stays in the place of permanent wounding. What we get to instead is not why did this happen, but now that this has happened, what will I make of it? Now that this has happened, I didn't like it, it wasn't right, it doesn't matter why it happened. It happened. Now that it has happened, what will I make of it? And that's just another way of saying, what's the story I'm going to tell about it to myself from now on? From this moment on, what's the story I will tell about this? Because I can tell a story that picks the scab off of it every single time, <laughs> right? And starts it all the healing process all over. Do you know that there's nothing to do to heal? There's nothing to do to heal. Everything heals automatically, every emotional wound, everything. It only doesn't heal, just like a physical room, if we keep picking it open. So our emotional wounds are the same way. So even if you are suppressing something, pushing it down, you're picking the scab. You just say, that happened. I'm not ashamed to admit it. It happened. It shouldn't have happened. I have whatever. I have cancer or I have... I declared bankruptcy or my business went out or whatever. That's what happened. I'm not ashamed of it. Now, I'm going to let that go. It will heal itself as I begin to move forward in my thinking. Is that it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of that. I'm not done with you, but that's the end of the CD. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you uh, a little bit about the books. Let me make sure I told you everything else I wanted to tell you. Oh, here's something else. This is something that I learned from Abraham years ago that it's so weird because I use this a lot and I never, I always forget to tell people this because it's so simple and it's so freaking brilliant. So if you know who Abraham Hicks is in their seminars and they, they take questions and they'll put somebody in what they call the hot seat, somebody will come up and ask questions and then Abraham, this woman Esther Hicks will channel answers and so something that they'll say a lot of times to people, this is so good. They'll say, take them completely out of the equation. So it'll be take him out of the equation, take her out of the equation, take it out of the equation, take whatever out of the equation. So what that actually means is that within our goal for whatever, for peace, for love, for joy, there's usually a story of something around that that we tend to focus on as the thing that we need to dominate, manipulate, and control. Right? I, would I want to have a joyful life, but my husband suffers from depression. OK, take him out of your equation. You take him out of your equation. He is not in your joy equation. You want to be prosperous, but the economy sucks. Take the economy out of your equation. Because all you're doing is using that as your excuse for being disconnected from the good that would flow if you would stop using that excuse. So, because first of all, if you wake up in the morning and your life is based on, I can't be happy today unless he's happy, you're already a dead woman. <laughs> right? You love him as he is. If you can help him, you help him. But you don't need for him to feel a certain way for you to feel a certain way. right? You take it out of the equation. You don't have to have $100,000 in the bank in order to feel prosperous. 
So you take out of the equation the thing that you're using to stop you from feeling the way you want to feel. I want to feel good in my body, but I need to lose this much weight or gain this much muscle. Take that out of the equation. Start right now to say, how can I feel good about my body right now as I'm taking my journey? As I'm, whatever, changing the way I'm eating or exercising differently. Because the only thing that matters is, am I going in the right direction? And when I fall down, then I just get back up, right? I start to eat a certain way, and it feels good. And then I find myself waking up from a nap covered in cake. <laughs> Go, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> So the ego then says, you, you're stupid. You have no self-discipline. You can't do anything right. You might as well just go ahead and eat the rest of the cake, eat it out of the garbage can. Who cares? Right? <laughs> right? No, you go, OK, that's fine. I made a mistake, and I blew it. Now you get right back on the path again. You go, that's fine. I did that. That's not going to, I'm taking that out of my equation for happiness, right? The point is, am I going in the right direction? That you build within the system backsliding and mistakes. But you don't use it as the excuse to cut yourself off from continuing on in the right direction. You don't go, oh, I blew it on Thursday. I'll start over again on Monday. No, you blew it on Thursday at lunch. Now you start over again at dinner. Right? You were going to save all that money, and then you woke up surrounded by Macy's bags. <laughs> Right? Whatever it is, you just go, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> she took over my mind again, that woman who spends all our money. <laughs> so you just, whatever, you just keep coming back to that place. All right, so quickly. Now, um, so this book, uh, I already told you, it's basically, I think there are 101 of just these little, you just slip it over, and basically, they soothe you. So each one starts with a quote, most of them from A Course in Miracles. And they're just a way to soothe you into your day. I made it nice and small so it would fit in a, your purse or backpack or something. Now this, th like I said, this is sort of invocations, but not really. Because it basically just has the prayers from invocation and the opening chapters about prayer and stuff like that. But then I took out all the exercises and the essays and stuff like that because people, frankly, didn't want bothered. <laughs> oh, God, don't make me do that. So <laughs> what it has instead <laughs> is... Um, because I've been lecturing on A Course in Miracles for you know, my third decade now, for many years what I did is I would take my course book, because you keep wearing them out, and I would write in the back like where all the things that I talk about all the time over these many years that you've heard me say a million times if you've come to my lectures, so that I could find them quickly. So now they're all in this book. So there's like 20 pages of the quote and where you can find it in the book. And they're basically listed by category. So like Course in Miracles favorite quotes um, on faith, on creating, on guilt and judgment, on the mind, on giving and receiving, on our function and being helpful, on dealing with problems, on joy, blah, blah, blah. Then there's um, like about 10 pages of what people call Jacobisms. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of the just like little, little reminders of, um, of just things that I say all the time. You know, little after me, like lots can happen. You don't live the life you deserve. You live the life you think you deserve. You're so vain, you probably think this talk is about you. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> just little things like that. <laughs> so that's in the Miracle Workers Handbook. Now, I'm going to be back here again in December sometime. Sometime in December. Um, so we haven't decided yet either on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning, because it's too hard to come here at night for me from LA. Because I have to, you don't want to know. It's just, a, it's just a story that would activate bad shit. So, <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. This is your assignment, should you choose to accept it. Something that, um, that I did with a group in May of this year, but. We, we can do it a little bit longer here. This is a great way to sort of start to take an emotional journey of thinking in a certain way. So what we did in May Mental Makeover Month was I had people on May 1st 
write a letter to me dated June 1st. So it was dated a month in the future. But these were letters they were not going to send me. So I'm not going to read them or anything like that. Uh, but it was for the benefit of the exercise, in which they wrote to me how they felt on June 1st about the May Mental Makeover Month. So it would just be things that were like, you know, I feel much better about my body, and I've gotten much healthier, and, or I got a new job, or I've gotten off of, you know, whatever. All of those things without knowing how. Because remember, how is not our part. If we knew how, it would already have happened. <laughs> what is our part, not how. The what, and then the emotional journey of consciousness. That's our part. So. What I would suggest is that you write me a letter dated sometime in December. And that your work then would be to imagine that you were telling me this when I come back in December. Oh, Jacob, remember when you were here in July? Well, I want to tell you what's happened to me in the interim how wonderful I feel, how things have unfolded, how that thing that was a problem is not a problem anymore, how that thing that I was working on has unfolded in perfect divine order, how da 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 whatever it is. And then what you do is print it out or write it out and then read it as much as it makes you feel good. I would say read it once a week, but if it makes you feel good, read it every day. If it makes you feel really good, read it twice a day. Because the idea is to get yourself in that place of that's what really treatment is. It doesn't make anything happen. It just shifts your consciousness to allow things to happen. Does that make sense? OK, so we'll do a quick prayer. And then I'm going to go into the back. There's a table back there. And I'll sign people's books if you have a book and if you want me to sign them. OK. So, once again, we close our eyes, take a deep breath. <sighs> As we come together now in gratitude for having been drawn together this evening by the power and in the presence of God, we take a moment to call to mind anyone that we know who may be afraid, who may be in pain, or who may be sick. We release them and surrender them now into the presence of that one divine mind where all things are held perfectly in the hands of God. We see now that within them is all the wisdom and power that they need, that they are being returned to their natural state of well-being. We take another moment to call to mind anyone with whom we've had difficulty, someone that we have judged or felt judged by in some way, perhaps someone that we have tied ourselves to, believing them to be the source of our pain or the source of our good. And we surrender all of these relationships now to the divine presence within. And we ask not for a particular form, but for a return to divine content to peace of mind, regardless of the form. And as we think about the days ahead, the places we may go, the people we may see, the things that we may do, we allow now this divine spirit within us to keep reminding us that it is the presence of God that we seek, that it is not something out there it is not to be found in money or people or things or situations. But that when we awaken to this presence, that all of the things and people and situations begin to become so much more effortless that we can relax, that we can enjoy and savor and be present without control without manipulation, without stress. In other words, we are healed. We offer ourselves now to this divine process. We offer our hands and our feet and our voices, asking the Holy Spirit within us, where would you have us go? What would you have us do and say and to whom? 
We remember now, as always, the way that we will know love and the way that we will feel love is by this divine love moving through us to the world around us. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. Thank you so much for coming. I will see you in December. <laughs>